Stephen King's books and stories have been adapted for the screen with regularity since Carrie debuted in 1976. When the Skeleton Crew collection of short stories was published in 1985, King's work had been adapted for the screen on at least 10 occasions already. The Night Shift collection alone eventually spawned six feature-length films, three made-for-TV movies, a TV episode, and most recently the Chapelweight series in 2021. The Skeleton Crew collection, however, comparatively inspired very few screen adaptations, and the ones it didn't inspire, aside from perhaps 2007's The Mist, aren't exactly fan favorites, and in some cases, King readers likely don't even know they exist. Hi there, I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this is a great undertaking. I've been making my way through every Stephen King publication and the innumerable adaptations they've inspired in a semi-chronological order for almost two years now, and I'm still only a decade into King's writing career. So if you like Stephen King's scary stuff and watching a man age in real time each week over the course of what will likely take decades, please consider subscribing to the channel. This video is going to be a compilation of sorts where I cover a handful of lesser known screen adaptations from the Skeleton Crew collection of short stories. I already covered The Mist and its two screen iterations in separate videos, so I will not be discussing those screen adaptations in this video. For whatever reason, Skeleton Crew, unlike the majority of King's other story collections, didn't result in very many adaptations, as far as Stephen King goes anyway. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Of the multiple movies and various interpretations Night Shift inspired, the majority of them are god-awful trash that I have no desire to watch again. In fact, all of my least favorite King screen adaptations that were shat forth into the world come from the Night Shift collection. So perhaps the limited number of Skeleton Crew stories that made it to the screen is a blessing. But for the few that did come to fruition following the publication of Skeleton Crew, I'm going to take a look at each of them individually in chronological order to see if there are any hidden gems in this small pile of what I anticipate to be mostly turds. I'll start each section with a brief summary of the original story and then dig a little deeper into the details of the screen adaptation. Word Processor of the Gods Richard receives a bizarre, unconventional word processor as a gift from his recently deceased nephew. At first glance, the electronic gadget appears to be an innocuous Frankenstein of parts, but upon using the device, it turns out that it holds a great deal of power, and the words that are put into it manifest themselves in real life. Richard realizes the machine is breaking down at a rapid rate, and he races against the word processor's inevitable destruction in order to delete his old life and write himself a new one. This adaptation originally aired in November of 1984 and is an episode from the show entitled Tales from the Dark Side. The show was planned to be an offshoot of the mildly successful 1982 Creepshow movie, and was created by none other than director and horror icon George Romero. The show ran for four years, totaling 89 episodes, and was essentially modeled after The Twilight Zone with episodes, ep episodes, episodes that ranged in genre from horror, thriller, to sci-fi and fantasy. I was unable to find this episode anywhere for streaming, but I managed to track down season one of Tales from the Dark Side on DVD for 10 bucks. So yeah, I own, I own the whole first season now, and after watching this one episode, I will happily give it away to anyone who wants it. I have no desire to watch any of the other episodes and like, likely won't be desiring to watch this one again. That's not to say Word Processor of the Gods was without its charms, though. 
despite the obvious restrictions of a low-budget, miserable synth soundtrack and some lackluster performances, the episode plays very close to the original story. I didn't hate it, but it's a very obvious product of its era. The word processor itself is pretty cool, and the show does a decent job at eliciting the same emotions and feelings of the original short story. The editing is kind of fun, and some of the special effects were incredibly primitive but endearing. There was an expected level of cheese, but of the 80s King adaptations I've suffered through, this one was among the more tolerable. However, it was only 20 minutes long, so that likely had something to do with it. Grandma. A young boy is left alone to watch over his elderly grandmother following a family emergency. The boy's grandmother has always made him feel uneasy and trepidatious, but he is determined to get over his fear and to prove to his mom that he is capable of taking care of the bedridden old woman. But after his mother leaves, the boy soon discovers that his apprehension toward being left alone with his grandmother was not unfounded. She is not just some feeble old woman, and he was right to be afraid of her. The worst part is, his mother knew it all along. This adaptation originally aired in 1985 and is an episode of the second iteration of The Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone is, of course, the popular anthology TV series, which originally began in 1959 and ran until 1964. The show has since been rebooted on three separate occasions, once in 1985, which was, of course, the version of the show this adaptation comes from, again in 2002, and most recently in 2019, with only two seasons airing before the show's cancellation in 2021. Like Word Processor of the Gods and most episodes that come from this style of anthology series, this adaptation of Grandma is a short episode that's just over 20 minutes long, which is well suited for adapting a short story such as Grandma. There isn't much in the way of fat to trim, and the screenwriters don't have to add or invent a whole bunch of additional story to fit the shorter runtime. That's not to say this episode is an entirely faithful retelling of the short story, but it is for the most part. The episode boasts some interesting camera work, creepy music, and can be genuinely suspenseful at times. Unfortunately, the child actor portraying the lead character, Georgie, who is in virtually every scene, isn't great in this role. His delivery is stiff and so obviously scripted, and a great deal of his lines are delivered via voiceover as if we can hear his thoughts. I don't mean to judge him too harshly as he was 10 or 11 years old at the time of filming, but the delivery of the lines and the voiceover stuff was detrimental to the overall experience. I knew I recognized this kid right away, but I couldn't put my finger on it. But it turns out his name is Barrett Oliver, and he's best known for his role as Bastion in the absolute classic The NeverEnding Story. I haven't seen that movie in quite some time, but I loved it when I was a kid. Barrett filmed The NeverEnding Story right around the same time that he filmed the Twilight Zone episode, and if you haven't seen The NeverEnding Story, you should check it out. This episode of The Twilight Zone, on the other hand, you could probably skip it. But there is a link in the description for anyone who wants to check it out. The Raft A foursome of teenagers decide to go for a brisk October swim at an isolated lake. In spite of the frigid waters, they eventually manage to convince themselves to take the plunge with varying degrees of hesitancy. The teens make their way out to the anchored raft that floats alone at the center of the lake, and once they are on board, they notice an unusual, seemingly innocuous black patch moving across the surface of the lake. However, the patch is alive, it is sentient, and it is hungry. This adaptation was a segment of the Creepshow 2 movie that was released in 1987. I've done a whole video for Creepshow 2 in which I cover the movie's production and this segment for The Raft, so I won't get too in-depth in regards to the history or background. You can check out my Creepshow 2 video, which is linked below if you'd like. Now, I didn't like Creepshow 2. Turns out campy comedic horror from the 80s just isn't my thing, and so my review of the movie is basically just me complaining about it from start to finish. 
But the segment for The Raft in particular really bothered me because of a regular issue I have with King's stories. That issue being the out of place horny sex stuff that just doesn't make sense to me. So in the actual short story following the deaths of their boyfriend and girlfriend, the two remaining teens decide to glaze the donut on the raft while the threat of the lake sludge remains. But in the movie, Homie just decides to molest his former best friend's girlfriend in her sleep, and that, of course, is way worse than the consensual act of taking old one eye to the optometrist that King wrote into the original story. I just find both acts completely ridiculous, and yet another example of King's use of weird, out-of-place, horny sex stuff throughout his bibliography. Aside from that issue, the segment for The Raft was probably the least awful part of Creepshow 2. That may sound like faint praise, but considering how much I disliked the movie overall, I assure you it isn't. Mercy. So, Mercy is a 2014 movie that is loosely based on the story Grandma. Mercy is a joint production between Jason Blum of Blumhouse and Mick G. Blumhouse is, of course, the best known for their work with Jordan Peele, the most recent Firestarter adaptation that released earlier in 2022, and and also for churning out films that vary so wildly in quality they that watching any of their films is a crapshoot. It's, it's either going to be incredible or incredibly bad. Mick G is best known for having worked on shows like The O.C., Supernatural, and Chuck, and he has a fairly extensive list of directing credits on feature-length films, and he directed a ton of music videos by bands like Sugar Ray, The Offspring, and Smash Mouth, just to name a few. So, with their combined credentials and experience, Jason Blum and Mick G should have been able to produce at least a passable movie, right? Well, I looked at the ratings and reviews that Mercy had accumulated since its release before watching it for myself, and, well, the first thing I noticed was that the movie has a 0% score on Rotten Tomatoes. 0%. That is impressive, really. There has only been one other movie I've watched for this channel with a 0% score, and that movie was Creepshow 3, a pus-encrusted anus pimple of a movie if ever there was one. The hardest part of this entire video was just convincing myself to watch Mercy, but I rented it for four bucks and took the plunge. And honestly, it deserves way more than a 0% score. There are some beautiful shots and cinematography, the score is solid, and the acting is decent. At worst, it's just a middle-of-the-road possession movie. Nothing remarkable or special for the genre, but nowhere near as bad as I imagined it would be based on its tomato meter reading. As far as being a strict retelling of Grandma, well, it's not that, but it's not completely off base either. The main premise and a number of details are present and accounted for, but the movie definitely adds to and expands on King's story. I wouldn't go so far as to recommend this movie. I'd at least come to its defense and stand by the statement that it doesn't warrant the level of hate that it has received. Survivor Type A man is stranded alone on a small island following a plane crash, with no hope in sight for rescue and potentially life-threatening injuries he is forced to take drastic measures. As time passes, his health and resources deplete. In his desperation, using the scant few tools and resources at his disposal, he begins to do things with and to his own body in an effort to survive. But his methods of robbing Peter to pay Paul lead him to become a fraction of his former self. This animated episode was part of the Creepshow series on Shudder, but was technically a part of an animated special that debuted between the first and second seasons in October of 2020. 
I covered this episode in my video ranking all the episodes from season 2 of Creepshow, and while I enjoyed this animated version of Survivor Type, the animation varies wildly in quality from one scene to the next. It's just inconsistent, but for the most part it's a cool depiction that's true to the story and keeps your attention. I've linked my video for Creepshow Season 2 in the description below if anyone wants to check that out for more details. Final thoughts. It's safe to say that the best adaptation from Skeleton Crew was the 2007 feature-length film for The Mist, which, as luck should have it, just popped up on Netflix. There have been numerous occasions where I have bought or rented a movie I needed to watch for this channel, only for it to become available for streaming on Netflix shortly after, and goddamn that's annoying. But it's on Netflix now, so you should watch it. I'm still not over that ending. Ugh. But yeah, just watch The Mist on Netflix. As for the rest of these adaptations, I mean, I guess that's up to you but I don't really recommend any of them. Uh, I am super excited for next week's video, which will be the first of a three-part series for It, one of Stephen King's most infamous stories. We're likely going to be discussing all kinds of super fun stuff like generational trauma, homophobic language, racism, and that scene, you know, that one horrible scene, that one freaking god-awful messed up scene. God damn it, Steven. What were you thinking? Why are you like this? <sighs> New videos drop on this channel every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so click to subscribe and get notifications, and I'll see you next week. Okay, goodbye. Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King, pretty pleased with blood and guts on top. My name is Mr. Doyle, and this has been a great undertaking. <laughs>